So hello everyone and welcome to WooStream, bringing Willamette to you. My name is Tiffany Newton and I'm the Director of Graduate Alumni Engagement here at Willamette University. Today's conversation features Brian Galini, Dean and Professor at Willamette's College of Law, along with members of the Class of 2020, who went from preparing for the July bar exam to becoming key members of the Racial Justice Task Force when they were granted diploma privilege by the Oregon State Supreme Court. Please welcome our panelists, Sam Clausen, Eden Vasquez, Kylie Gray, Michael Wallace, and Julie Preciado. The task force used bar study time to contribute to the profession and inform the conversation on racial justice by studying the preemptory challenge, a tool used by attorneys during jury selection to remove jurors without having to state a reason. They concluded that the challenge needs work or it needs to go. Thank you for joining us this evening, both to share your personal experiences in navigating everything that you all went through last summer, as well as the great work that has come out of this historic decision and your efforts on the task force. Dean Galini, I'll hand things off to you. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany, and good evening to everyone, and my thanks to the panelists for joining us. It's really, quite candidly, a thrill to be with all of you. Who would have thought that all the way back in March, April, May of this time last year that we'd be here together having accomplished this work and having navigated the circumstances that we've navigated. Just know that the College of Law is proud of you and, and I am proud of you and all of the work that you've done. I want to dive just right in and I want to go right back to May of last year. And I want to just ask the very direct question, you know, as the world was sort of turning upside down for all sorts of reasons, how were you feeling while preparing for the bar exam in the middle of the pandemic where there was just so much uncertainty about what that might look like? And so I'll turn, I guess, uh, to you first, Julie, please. Thank you, Dingley, um, and thanks for having us here. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we can probably all remember back to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I feel like that the, the beginning of the pandemic was just really defined by fear and uncertainty. Um, all of a sudden, we were thrust into a completely new environment um, where we didn't have the resources we were used to. Uh, most importantly, quiet study spaces, the library, uh, reliable internet was a really, really big deal. All of a sudden, um, not having that necessarily at home. Um, access to professors before and after classes to clarify things that might have been uncertain from the lecture, um, the support of our peers. All of a sudden, we were just at home by ourselves, on the screen all the time, and uh, with completely different environments. And it was different. It was really different for everybody. A lot of people had small children at home. Um, partners were losing jobs. Um, people didn't have a place to study. There's no quiet space for a lot of people to use. Uh, it was a scary time. Um, for sure. And I think that there was just, uh, life was on hold. We didn't know what was going to happen next. It was a question of, can I keep my grades up? Does it even matter if I keep my grades up? What's happening in the world? Uh, and not knowing what was going to happen with the bar exam, how it was going to play out, how we were going to be able to study, if the bar exam was going to happen, uh, if it was going to put us in danger. And I think we were just hearing conflicting information from news outlets and on the media, and with everything being online, classes online, it is really hard to not just start doom scrolling through all of this flood of bad news and Twitter feeds. And uh, it was definitely a very scary time and one defined by completely new environment for everybody. Um, but certainly that hit a lot of people a lot harder than others. And I think um, Sam has uh, wants to share some stories of people that we heard from that were really affected pretty badly in that, at that time. Well, thank you. And, and on that note, yeah, Sam, please jump in. Yeah, so to broaden Julie's experience, what she experienced was something that a lot of other students experienced as well. We sent out a survey before the court's decision um, asking recent graduates what their experience was during coronavirus and Julie touched on a couple of the points, loss of income, lost jobs. Uh, some people shared stories of them having to sell their prized possessions, personal belongings, just to make ends meet and make it so that they had um, enough money to put a roof over their head. Uh, folks lost childcare. People shared really heart-wrenching stories of having to take a step back from their dreams, careers, 
lives, even bar prep itself, in order to take care of their children. Um, some family members and students themselves contracted the virus. And at the beginning of the pandemic, which was when we were studying, things were really uncertain. So people didn't know what that meant for their personal health or for their family members. Um, it was also really taxing on people's mental health. Uh, some people shared stories about how members of their family had lost their lives to suicide because of the pulls and the mental taxation. Um, and when family members and students were experiencing these tragedies in isolation, that really, I think, made a huge pull on people's lives. Um, some people shared stories about them being displaced from homes. Like Julie said, uh, study environments were really uncertain. Um, people shared with us about how they couldn't really find adequate internet, how they had a really difficult time securing safe and productive study spaces. I know one member of our team who sent out the survey was studying in his shed. And the more we heard from people's responses, the more we heard that those circumstances were not unique to just a couple of people participating in the survey. Um, so folks were facing a lot of difficulty, a lot of trauma, a lot of tragedy, and all at the same time, trying to study for the bar, trying to secure their future, trying to make it so that their hundreds of thousands of dollars and three years of uh, work towards a degree meant something. And um, I think it, it uh, something that was really highlighted from a lot of these experiences, and I want to underscore this, is that what we heard from people was not unique to the bar exam. These are difficulties and hardships that people face every day. And I think what happened to us during the bar exam is that more of us felt it. So it was really an issue of scale more so than an issue of uniqueness of the pandemic. It made it so that a lot of us experienced hardships that are generally faced by lots of populations within our community. When I close, I might pivot back to you on that note, Julie, and just talk a little bit about, maybe it's not just, uh, quote unquote, just the pandemic, but, but of course there were other things going on uh, during that summer. I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, that sounds like 2020 in general, right? It's like it wasn't just one anything, it's just one thing after another. And so, yes, I think that was, we were all really struggling. And I mean, I, we really can't stress that enough. It was um, really shocking to read and heart-wrenching. To, I mean, I think we were all, probably all in tears when we read the stories um, after having a survey of asking other how other people were affected. Um, and then after uh, George Floyd um, was murdered or passed away, uh, we, a lot of students were really having a difficult time with deciding what to do there. Because, uh, you know, so many of us go to law school because we want to make a difference in the world. And here it seems like one of the biggest reckonings of social justice of our lifetimes, of our lifetimes, and we wanted to get out on the streets and protest and make our voice heard. And, uh, maybe help defend protesters in court. I just really wanted to, I think so many of us wanted to get out there and make a difference, but there's, there was a conflict between, okay, but I have to put in eight hours of study time today. How am I going to do that and, and go make a difference? Um, and also there was the continuing threat of, of, to health and safety of getting out there and being involved in a, in a mass group when uh, we were all being told to be isolated. And I think, uh, you know, as Sam mentioned, this really just uh, underscored some of the, the bigger inequities um, that are always there. But in particular, students of color, uh, Black, Indigenous, and students of color were really affected by, like, I can't believe this is happening in my country, and I want to make a difference, and, and I can't. I'm torn between uh, continuing to pursue my livelihood that I've spent over three years now since the LSAT, maybe who knows how long planning this, and then I have to decide if I am gonna throw my heart and soul into studying or if I'm gonna throw my heart and soul into this big movement of uh, civil unrest that's happening. And I think also, you know, living in Portland myself, it was really hard to, it was just so hard to concentrate. It was difficult to sleep. There was helicopters passing over my house every single night. Um, we were seeing videos, even if we weren't there ourselves, of, of our city on fire. 
uh, the place that I worked at the, the courthouse, um, the federal courthouse, there's is graffiti everywhere outside and not without reason. There was certainly, re- there was, we, we all felt what was happening, um, but it was just really hard to, to see all that and go through that by ourselves at home while we're trying to study. And um, it, it made it almost impossible to focus. So um, I'm just glad we made it here today. I appreciate that. I, I think from my own perspective, I remember showing up in uh, almost to the day this time last year and my first move, I'm going to put that in quotes as Dean was to wander around a building that I had been in precisely twice. And that was exclusively for the interview uh, process as a candidate. And I'm wandering around with Dean Dobbins with uh, a measuring tape and a totally imperfect understanding of, of what COVID meant. After all, at that time, we were wiping down groceries. We were just through you know, the shortages in the grocery stores trying to figure out well, why did everybody buy toilet paper and are we behind? And, you know, you, you put it well. I, and I think from my perspective is, as Dean, I was watching all of this sort of unfold and the combination of when I think about that, that measurement took place in April, uh, George Floyd was May 25th. And then I watched our students sit for the SIM MBE on, uh, I think it was June 19th. And I remember distinctly walking by watching students wear a mask, have to sit apart, limit access to the restroom. I even remember helping Dean Dobbins line up the chairs outside of Collins and permit our our graduates to walk in one at a time. And I also remember visiting with students this concern about whether an elevated temperature on the day of, if they were sitting in a hot car after working for X number of months, all of those things would that preclude them from, from actually sitting from the bar itself after uh, doing all of that work simply because their, their temperature might be elevated. And I definitely remember walking away from walking our, watching our, our examinees take the SIM and be under those circumstances and thinking to myself, you know, whatever it is that the bar is designed to test, it's not going to do that under these circumstances. And so we can have the discussion about whether the bar is a good thing or it's a bad thing, but whatever it is at that moment in 2020 in June that was my light bulb where I felt like, okay, we need to move from simultaneously supporting our students in this disruptive space to also thinking about alternative pathways to admission. And so I guess that takes me up to, and someday maybe I'll be on the back of a trivia card for being the only unofficial (laughs) dean to to appear before the state Supreme Court. Um, But in any event, I, I did, and I recall the court's decision and sort of holding my breath, waiting to see what the court might do after the Oregon deans put their heads together and and petitioned uh, petitioned the court. Maybe I'll take us back to that space and ask, and this time maybe I'll open with you, Kylie. Can, can you talk to, uh, to us a little bit about whether you were still studying for the bar while you were waiting for the court's decision and how you were balancing that as against the updates you might have been getting from either from, from us as the administration or from OSB? I was definitely still studying for the bar, but maybe that's just my uh, OCD nature. Uh, And I continued studying after the court made the decision until the moment I turned the paperwork in accepting diploma privilege. Um, But it was a difficult, I go back to June and I remember uh, taking the simulated MBE and and sitting uh, socially distanced outside at lunch with a few of my peers and having this discussion about, um, this is a few weeks before the court made their decision and just was the was it even feasible for the bar exam to happen? Uh, at that time, cases were skyrocketing in Oregon comparatively. Obviously, they're a little higher now and they've been higher since. But at that time, it was unpredictable. And we were getting new updates. Both um, Dean Galini and Professor Myers did a fantastic job of updating Willamette students uh, regularly about what OSB was doing to make sure that they were gonna protect us and our health and safety during the exam. We were also getting updates from OSB. Um, There was speculation that the bar was gonna be administered in multiple locations and they couldn't tell us where. Uh, At the time, there was speculation that there would be temperature checks like you mentioned. Um, Just a lot of different information coming at us and nothing definitive, which made it really difficult. I mean, I think studying for the bar is difficult to do. Uh, anytime, but I think it was especially difficult under these circumstances where you've put in at that point, uh, by the time the court made their decision in early July, 
um, or late June. By the time that decision was actually made, uh, we I had put in eight weeks of study. I was 85% done with the Barbary program. Um, and I still didn't know that there was going to be an exam in July. And I think that was one of the hardest things for me is I put in all this time and what do I do if the bar exam gets pushed back to October or pushed back again to February? And is it is it safe for me to take an exam? And while I feel like we had great communication moving about all the changes and OSB was doing the best job they could to adjust and ensure that we could take the exam in a safe environment, it was um, difficult to hear the news from one end and kind of compare that, uh, what was going on in the world to to whether I thought there was going to be an exam that could even take place. Well said. How about how about you, Eden? From your perspective, what was your experience like? Yeah, so I continued to study for the exam, like Kylie, I think up until I turned the diploma privilege um, paperwork in. Um, but I think larger than than COVID, bar people sitting, students sitting for the bar exam this year just could not catch a break with all of these things that were coming up. I think those of us that were um, going to take it in July, dealing with the pandemic and kind of the uncertainty of that, which the panelists have discussed, um, those sitting for it in October, dealing with uh, the Oregon wildfires and California wildfires that were going on at that time in August. And then those of us who I sat for the February bar exam um, lost, I, for example, lost power in my house for nine days because of the ice storms right before the exam. Um, so I think that there was all these things that compounded. So even those people that might have decided to set over taking the bar exam because of COVID, there were these additional things that kind of popped up along the way that were in kind of distractions while trying to study for this huge test. And what about your perspective, Michael? How, how was your experience as you navigated that particular that particular summer? Um, well, I certainly wish that I would have been in Salem for the simulated MBE. Uh, instead, my fiance and I were at her mom's house, uh, taking it with her niece and nephew banging on the door while we tried to work through the multiple choice, which was an interesting experience. Um, the thing I really remember about decision day is leading up to it, I'd uh, you know, been looped in by some of these uh, incredible people about the idea that we we're going to be petitioning for uh, diploma privilege. And the practitioners I talked to um, kind of had the idea that if you have a reason not to take the test and you're going to end up with the same license, why not do it? And I've got two parents who are in their 70s, a sister and her husband who are immunocompromised and um the, the thing that was weighing on me uh, in large part when the court announced that they were going to allow diploma privilege is, unlike these brilliant ladies, I hadn't lined up a job before graduation. Um, <laughs> so I think that that was a big consideration is how are employers going to react? Um, and for me, it was a big encouragement. And I, I need to thank you and the other deans. Uh, my fiance had already gotten a job, uh, but the partners at her firm weren't sure about diploma privilege. And uh, you guys sat and talked with them and pretty easily change their minds uh, from what I heard. So, um, you know, I, I definitely valued going through and studying for everything. Uh, but, you know, your advocacy for us once we got the diploma privilege is the thing that really sticks with me. Well, that's very kind of you. I, I remember that weekend, it, it wasn't pretty. I had moved, <laughs> I moved across the country amid this pandemic and, and we were trying to move in the behind the scenes there was not uh, maybe not for public consumption. I distinctly remember being surrounded by boxes and you know the, the Oregon deans quickly put their heads together and thought, you know, we need to be thinking about how we could speak with one voice. So I remember unpacking boxes with one hand and uh, we only had two days over the weekend to pull it together. And so you know, on one side of my eye, I'm watching emails and we're trading edits and I'll leave to your imagination what it looks like behind the scenes to ask three deans to speak with one voice and, and you can kind of plug that in for yourselves. Uh, but in any event, suffice it to say that we we used every humor aside, we used every minute that, that we had those two days to get a singular submission together. And then, of course, the downstream was was our faculty and our faculty was very thoughtful, as I know the University of Oregon's was and, and Lewis and Clark's was and, and supporting our students in this space. And so we had to think about, well, what did that look like? And, and of course, everyone was spread across the country, couldn't sign anything. 
uh, but we wanted to represent their voice. And so there was quite a bit of uh, angst and consternation to make sure that on the faculty side and the administrative side that that uh, that everyone felt heard. But you're kind to say that I, w I wish I had a smoother <laughs> behind the scenes story to share. Uh, but I guess maybe I would transition us then into the work, you know, why we're here, which is the, the work of the task force and to talk a little bit about, you know, here we are in July uh, and, we're, and we're moving into August and we started to have some conversations about, you know, what should we do uh, about the space that we now have, the, the time that we would ordinarily spend studying for the bar and, and whether we should repurpose that. And I distinctly remember visiting with with Justice Nelson and and the court's work and her impressive work on the committee on on bias in the Oregon justice system. And then separately, I had an opportunity to have a conversation with a faculty member, Professor Robert Chang at, at Seattle, and the work that that ad hoc task force had done in, in Washington. And I remember vaguely our initial conversation, uh, Sam and Eden, and, and talking a little bit about you know, what we might do in this space and, and to talk a little bit about what that might even look like. And I wonder if we can now talk from your perspective about you moved from studying for the bar, to putting up with me asking you, well, what are you going to do now? And, and take me back to that moment. And even maybe I'd, I'd ask you first for your how that played out for you. I think that as soon as the decision was made, Sam and I were on the phone with each other trying to figure out what can we do with our free time now? What can we do that will make a difference? As Julie was saying, a lot of us um, wanted to be on the ground and involved in uh, racial justice issues and, and creating equity in the system and trying to address systemic racism. And a lot of those conversations started this summer. And once we had that additional time before we started our employment um, in the fall, we kind of we're thinking, well, what do we do now? And so we saw what the Washington ad hoc uh, task force was able to do, reached out to them and were able, were provided more information and um, brought together the class of 2020, those who had received diploma privilege and were interested in helping out. Um, so, so grateful to everyone who joined our task force and wanted to use this um, newfound free time to really make a difference reaching out, so grateful to Willamette for kind of getting the ball rolling on this um, project, moving from one project to now um, the project that we were able to address the narrow topic and making our report on implicit bias and peremptory challenges. And I think that that was crucial for us to be able to take on a narrow issue that we could really get down in the weeds into what was going, what's going on, what was the Oregon's history, what are our recommendations, and put forth a report that could have an impact on Oregon's criminal justice system and the, the jury selection process. Well, how about you, Kylie? What, what was that? As the workflow started to come together, how, how did that play out for you? And what was your perspective as the task force started to get formed and and, and maybe I'd throw into this mix how, how you felt trying to position yourself from study for the bar to now this completely different headspace. I know when uh, Sam and Eden first reached out about involvement on the task force and kind of shared uh, what they were thinking and their desire to contribute uh, something and get involved in this uh, social movement that was going on around us while we were doing bar prep, uh, I was immediately interested. I knew uh, after George Floyd in May that I wanted to be involved, but had felt, like others have said, a little bit held back by uh, both uh, health and safety concerns, but also uh, the bar exam uh, and that pending. So I knew uh, when we got the diploma privilege decision and uh, when Sam and Eden reached out with a plan that I was interested right away. And as things started to come together and we moved from uh, a project uh, kind of reinvigorating the 1994 report that was done into this more narrow issue on peremptory challenges. Uh, I thought it was really neat to see this opportunity to complement some of the work the Oregon justice system is already doing. So one of the things that this uh, 
specific report does is we got to partner a little bit with the Committee on Bias in the Oregon Judicial System. And they're doing some great work already. Um, and for example, they've put out the unconscious bias video training that's currently showed to jurors across the state. And so this was a really good opportunity as the project came together to fill a need that was actually needed in the state and to complement work that's already being done, which is a great, a great way to contribute right away. Well said. And maybe, Sam, your perspective as stewarding some of these efforts, talk a little bit, about, if you would, about your perspective on the report, the contribution you think it makes, and just your experience generally also switching into this different headspace from studying for the bar. Broke the cardinal rule. Um, so uh, my, my experience personally moving into this was that I was really motivated, invigorated, and inspired by the advocacy done to the Supreme Court on the diploma privilege issue. It felt like an equity solution, and I wanted to be part of something bigger moving forward. I wanted to carry on the work to something additional. And when Eden first gave me that call, I said, yes, this is awesome. This is the type of advocacy work that we went to law school to do. And so I was immediately really excited. I knew that we had a really great, talented group of people who expressed interest in being involved in these types of issues from lots of different backgrounds where they had experience in criminal courts before. And so this felt like a niche where we could fill a void that would assist what was being done already. So like Kylie said, this felt meaningful and purposeful. And I'll, I'll get into the details of the report as well, just the nitty gritty of what we found. Um, and so the premise of it starting off is that the Supreme Court has held that elimination of a juror based on race, so elimination of a person who's a prospective juror on the basis of his or her race is unconstitutional. It violates the Equal Protection Clause. And we found that studies consistently showed that BIPOC jurors were removed at a disproportionate rate as compared to white jurors. And we what we evaluated was a mechanism where attorneys can eliminate a juror without having to provide a stated cause. So that, that's already been alluded to by Tiffany, but it's the peremptory challenge. So it's a no cause strike and attorneys are given a certain amount of strikes where they can say, I don't want this person to serve on my jury and I'm not going to have them here. So they're just allowed to strike them without having to provide a reason for it. And that opens up what we found is two doors of discriminatory use. The first is purposeful discrimination, which we believe attorneys are generally good and that they don't intend to discriminate. We think that this type of, of uh, discrimination is rare, but it's still one of the doors. The second door is a gut feeling. So if an attorney says, I don't really like this juror. I don't think they're going to ad advocate or benefit my client. Then they can remove them based off of that gut feeling. And many, what we learned is that that gut feeling is often rooted in stereotyping, sometimes and often unconscious stereotyping. Um, research also showed us that there is pervasive unconscious animus against BIPOC communities. And uh, just, Chief Justice Marshall, during a Supreme Court opinion called Batson versus Kentucky, discussed this issue, the second door that's open to implicit bias. And he said that the bias that exists requires attorneys to acknowledge that bias within themselves, be aware of something that exists unconsciously within them, and then make a decision acknowledging that bias. And that to him and to us seems like a pretty insurmountable task for every attorney to accomplish. So what we have instead is just this mechanism by which two open doors of discrimination exist. And um, for this reason, for the propensity of abuse and discriminatory use in peremptory challenges, a lot of scholars, a growing number of judges, even Supreme Court justices has advocate, have advocated for the abolition of the peremptory challenge. Um, even countries like Canada and England, England originally created the peremptory challenge, have done away with it themselves. 
Um, Batson then, so getting to sort of the, the underpinnings of our report, Batson attempted but failed to address this discrimination that occurs in peremptory challenges. Uh, they created a test where the uh, opposing counsel, after a, an attorney strikes, so let's say a prosecutor strikes, the defense attorney can say, um, I suspect that to be on the basis of race. The, that forces an explanation of the prosecutor in this example. And if it's a race neutral explanation, then it's okay. And research shows that BIPOC jurors are still excluded from jury service at a disproportionate rate, even after Batson was, uh, was, it came into law. Um, and it's pretty easy to see why that's the case. Uh, even as I said, Justice Marshall pointed this out at the time. First, an attorney can intentionally evade the, uh, the challenge. They can make up a fake reason. Um, second, which is more likely, is that the attorney doesn't realize that the reason they want that juror removed is rooted in perceptions about a person based off of their race. Um, and plus, there's an additional barrier where attorneys who exercise the Batson challenge have to call out their colleagues, att other attorneys in the legal profession, for potentially having a um, discriminatory motive. Um, so all of these barriers make it make Batson largely considered to be ineffective at preventing discrimination. Um, the conclusion of our report is uh, to eliminate First, so we came up with two. The first is to, to eliminate the mechanism of uh, abuse, and that is the peremptory challenge. So the first one just says, do away with no cause challenges, require a cause every time. Um, then the second one is the adoption of solutions created by Washington and California. Uh, we put together a hybrid of what we believe to be the best parts of each. The adopted rules in Washington and California essentially strengthen Batson to make it more effective. Um, it, it has the same steps as Batson, but if uh, in evaluating a race neutral explanation, um, the court finds that an objective observer could view race as a motivating factor, then that strike is invalid. So it makes it easier to succeed on it. Um, and then it also lists uh, presumptively invalid reasons that are historically associated with groups that fall under protected categories, um, and it expands the class of persons protected. So it's a long way of saying this addresses a, me a discriminatory mechanism in our legal system. Thank you for that. And I, I suppose before we move forward at all, I would reiterate my thanks to you and to the task force for the considerable work that went into that. I suppose it gets me thinking about, you know, regardless of what academics, practitioners, the judiciary, the media, et cetera, might think about those conclusions. I think from my perspective, I would highlight that it starts a conversation or more accurately forces a, a conversation about how we're stewarding jury selection. And I, and I suppose that's really the overarching point is the ability to engage in conversations like this one that in some ways gets me thinking about the skills related to standing up that conversation as opposed to the skills associated with taking the exam, the bar exam. And perhaps that moves us into thinking about really what's next. And, and you know, have you as a task force opened a door to thinking about uh, alternatives to the bar exam, alternatives to the way that we think about licensure and in that spirit, thinking about this, again, the skills for practice versus the skills for sitting for an exam. And so maybe to be direct, I wonder what opportunities the task force kind of envisions for the graduates that are coming after you and, and where you see this experience kind of informing that conversation. Uh, and I know we're only a few months out, but, but Julie, maybe your thoughts on this and, and how you see that conversation playing out. Well, yeah. Uh, thanks, Dean. I, I think that, what this really highlighted in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of the civil unrest, uh, in the middle of chaos that was 2020, is that the bar requires a, the, the bar exam requires a lot of privilege. We know that there's so many barriers to entry in the, in the legal profession, period, in general, but the bar exam was a huge one. Um, to take three months off of work to, and also of, of school and 
a, a lot of people are able to get um, school loans during um, law school. And so that's, a, that's the way that they provide for themselves. And all of a sudden you're, you're cut off from that and you're still not able to practice your profession. Um, so to take off three months from any source of income and be able to live, that just in itself is a, is a huge, pretty much nearly insurmountable um, barrier for so many people. How are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to eat? Uh, how are you going to take care of your kids? Um, so it really does require a level of privilege. You have to either have a partner that's paying for things or parents um, or some sort of independent wealth um, that you might have, or perhaps that you were one of the students that were lucky enough to have really good grades and have a job lined up and your, your job is going to give you a, a bar stipend or something like that. So just bare minimum, just taking the time off is, is coming from a place of privilege. And then uh, to pay for the, the exam preparation soft, or software or program is, is usually very expensive. Uh, we luckily have it included with um, our Willamette tuition, but most students don't have that, that, um, that fortune. So you have to pay for the exam, you have to take care of yourself for several months. And then what we saw you know, this time around was just these inequities always exist. Um, but then during the pandemic, without a place to study, with kids at home, not in school, uh, all of a sudden it just, they really did become insurmountable for so many people. And they really always are, you know, with, with the light of the end, at the end of the tunnel right now with the, with the pandemic, these issues are not going away. People are still going to face them. Students are still going to come up across them in the future. Um, and uh, Eden and I actually did both take the bar exam after Oregon granted diploma privilege. Um, and I think that we can both attest to the fact that uh, it doesn't feel necessarily like what we were tested on in the bar exam. First of all, we were privileged and fortunate enough to be able to be in positions where we could study and then take the exams. Um, but I don't feel that that's necessarily, you know, having seen both, um, I feel like I learned a lot more from the experiential learning that I got at Willamette, being a part of Willamette's uh, legal clinic, being a part of several externships, and then uh, being a part of the advocacy. I and mean, I think that that really is the main one. It felt like you know, when we were advocating for diploma privilege and when we were working on this task force report, we were doing real work. And uh, it was what, what we came here to do. All of a sudden it was, uh, it didn't even really feel like a choice. Once we heard people's stories of what they were going through in the start of the pandemic, and once we realized that we could do something about it, it's like, okay, we came here to, let, we came to school to learn how to advocate for ourselves and for others and to make a difference. And we have to do it now that we heard that people are struggling and we're in a position to do it. We have to. So I felt like um, that's really what came to the forefront for me as the most meaningful experience I've had thus far in preparation for practice was getting out there and actually practicing. You know, we're advocates and getting out there and advocating is what really um, is much more a meaningful test of, uh, of your readiness and your preparedness to practice. And so I really do hope that, you know, we can be an example. And it's hard because we've all still faced so many issues coming out of this um, odd year, uh, to say the least. But I think that I hope that we can. I hope that we can show that, hey, look, we are prepared in so many other ways and that there are other ways to measure our preparedness. And uh, there's other more helpful avenues to show competency and to prepare us to get to get grads out there practicing law sooner and serving the communities because that's what we came here to do. I think Sam has right, more ideas on that. No, that's great. Yeah, Sam, from your perspective, uh, look into your crystal ball and tell us from your vantage point, you know, what where where do you see these next steps and the extent to which your experience might serve as a guidepost for some of those next steps? I guess just to repeat um, Julie's sentiments, I think uh, having opportunities for us to advocate and for us to practice the skills that are necessary to being a good attorney earlier on, I think has a much stronger correlation to the practice of law. So to your question, looking forward, I hope that whatever changes are made, those changes are made with an eye towards what does an attorney need to do to be a good attorney? How do we protect the public by 
creating a test that actually ensures that the public is protected. And I, I think that there are lots of different ways to accomplish that. And I do hope that elements of what we did are incorporated into that future, whatever the future of the bar looks like. So for example, um, the report that we put together tests and it gives us an opportunity to build our skills in research, in writing, in analysis, collaboration, problem solving, problem identification. Those are all skills that are highly important and highly necessary to being a good attorney. And I think that they have a much stronger correlation to the practice of law than um, a, a standardized test, the, the exercise of a standardized test. Um, it also, like Julie said, it allowed us to contribute to the legal profession and to our community immediately. So we were granted diploma privilege and almost the following day, we started coordinating this report. We started recruiting students to participate in this report. And I don't think it took us longer than three or four days to get the full 20 person task force built up because people were eager to do something like this. And so I hope that whatever, whatever the bar reform conversation is like moving forward, it considers how to get these highly educated, highly skilled students from the law school to the actual practice of law, to actual advocacy more quickly and without the barrier of a standardized test. Well said, I think before I turn things back over to Tiffany, I, I guess I might throw into this mix, the bar summer on average to, to Julie's point is around $7,000 at the, at the margins. Um, and I think really, Sam, your comments force us as we're collectively pushing the conversation to ask, what does it really mean to pass the bar? And, and as I'm sure everyone listening knows, there are different answers to that question, depending on where you certify your, your exam score. So our cutoff score is different from other jurisdictions. So until I might quote unquote pass relative to other states, but maybe not this one. And so this idea that, that I pass or fail the bar exam as binary, I think we've really got to navigate. And, and I guess I would also add that we've got to navigate what we want to accomplish through the bar exam. And if what we want is to provide a standardized test, then let's lean in and own that. Uh, but if on the other hand, we want to demonstrate minimum competence, let's think about whether the standardized test is the best way to steward that. And then correspondingly, one other answer might be, well, we need this to protect the public, but I think we need to dive into other states, most notably Wisconsin and to a lesser degree, but still importantly, New Hampshire, whether there's been any differential uh, in protecting the public as it relates to passing a bar versus diploma privilege. And at least the scholarship I re I've reviewed suggests that there's not a significant empirical difference between the two. And so that leaves us with, you know, are we just forcing the bar? Because that's what I had to go through. And I, and I actually mean, I as in me, you know, I, I had to take the bar, so you should too. And certainly we should, we should be thinking at a higher level, I think, uh, than merely the, what I might phrase as sort of the hazing rationale around the bar. So I suppose I'll, I, will, I will be done there uh, with my thanks to all of you and turn it back to you, Tiffany, uh, for further discussion. Thank you all so much for covering so many different um, aspects of your personal experiences, but also relating some of the challenges you each encountered, as well as your peers um, in this process. And in the year that was 2020, I cracked up every time Julie was, and then there was an ice storm and there was a fire and then power outages. I mean, you you couldn't get a, a more problem solving group of lawyers. You couldn't find them. That's our hashtag. You couldn't find them anywhere. Um, so really, I, I just want to give you all an opportunity while we wait for people to submit their questions. If, if there's anything else you think we didn't touch on that really relates to how th this just embodies the word, to my mind, praxis. You're putting theory into practice. You've taken all of the skills, all that you've learned, all that you have invested in yourself and that your academic community has invested in you and put that at the service of your community in a very specific tangible way to engender some change on something that where there's like real potential to make a big difference. And I just wonder if there's any aspect of that we maybe missed or that, or that you might want to go into just a little bit more in depth. 
uh, I guess I'll hop on that first. Um, I'm excited to see how this could serve as a jumping off point to uh, further eliminating juror bias, um, maybe that wouldn't be captured by a traditional Batson challenge. Um, I think I was one of two or three people uh, on the task force who ended up working in criminal defense, and I ended up going to work sooner than the others. So uh, while a lot of people were able to spend Westlaw uh, hours during the day, I was at work doing hearings and you know trying to talk to practitioners in between those hearings. Um, and one of the big things I heard was, it sounds great what you guys are doing, but uh, when you look at rural counties, for instance, you get... Uh, prospective jurors who are excluded because they need a translator. Um, you know, obviously our report doesn't go after that. So I'm excited to see how that's going to influence it. Um, and being in a, a rural county like Yamhill, last week they had a conversation with Justice Nelson and the bench about how racial equity looks uh, in the Oregon justice system. So knowing that um, we're part of this movement to fix the problems in our system and make things better for everyone is just very encouraging to me. Thank you for that piece. We actually have a question um, from Adrian. Thank you all for your efforts and hard work on, on this topic. While this is an area that could embody a lifetime of work, are there plans for the task force to address other issues of race equity in trial courts or beyond in the short term? I can. Maybe. Oh, please, please, Sam. I, I can jump on that. There is no. Um, there's no formal plans to reconvene the task force to tackle something else. This was an opportunity for us to use the time we would have spent studying for the bar instead on something that we found to be productive and needed. Um, what we hope instead is that this is the starting point for another group of hopefully motivated students or uh, another group of, of recent graduates, if, if there is bar reform using their time, they would have spent studying for the bar doing something like this instead. So uh, to answer your question, no, there aren't. I do think that this has kickstarted, as you said, a lifetime of work in this. There have already been conversations had, I think with most of us as, as task force members on what we see as need in the community and how we can help. And I know myself, I uh, am trying to be more involved in social justice groups, in the social justice bar. And I don't think that I would have been confident in doing that had I not had this experience. I feel like this gives me a leg to stand on and some, uh, some education and experience on the issues being faced by communities who need it. And so I think that uh, this is a platform for us to jump off of. I think it's also foundation for another group to pick up. I want to piggyback off Sam a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, but one of the exciting things that we've seen is that this report is already being distributed um, outside of this task force. Certainly it's being um, sent around to other people who have decision-making power. And we're excited to see the ways that could change. And I know internally, although there may not be formal plans to reconvene the entire task force to take on a different project, I know internally many of us are having conversations with each other about uh, ways that we can continue to be involved in social justice movements and ensuring racial equity on uh, within the Oregon judicial system and the way we move forward. So some of the things that Michael mentioned, I know those are movements that we're all passionate about after this experience. And there are different ways that each of us will continue to contribute, uh, whether we reconvene the uh, official formal task force or not. I think just to add on to that, um, whether it's some semblance of the old task force or an entirely new group, um, we had some giant shoulders that we were able to stand on to help us out. Uh, I know me specifically, I see he's in the uh, attendee list, uh, Justice Landau, uh, talk with me for an hour uh, about the potential constitutional rights implicated. So um, the Oregon judiciary uh, definitely has some outstanding people that whoever is on the task force, uh, they'll have support and definitely be able to move the ball even further than we did. 
And I, the, the second question we got kind of touched on, Dean Galini, your viewpoint of this project, and if you have thoughts of how you might be able to use a similar experiential model for the next class, or, or are you seeing ways where you could maybe integrate this into some of the ongoing work at the school? Yeah, I mean, how much time do we have, I think, is, is the first answer. I mean, to keep it movie trailer, um, but, but happy to dive more into the weeds, I think I would reiterate something that, uh, that we've heard a couple of times, which is this is a platform. This is a starting point. I don't want anyone listening, attending, or otherwise thinking that Willamette's relationship to these conversations is binary, therefore over. We are just loosening hamstrings. And so there's all sorts of ways that that can play out. Um, one of the ways, at first, I want to make sure that everyone also understands before, before I get to that, that the work that our graduates did, we look at other jurisdictions that received diploma privilege. No other law school did this. No other grad, graduate class did this type of work. So when we say platform, it's not just a platform to move into other spaces, which I'll touch on in a moment, but it's also a platform to provide the blueprint for what we expect students and examinees and graduates to do if there's going to be some type of different, I'm going to put bar exam in quotes because that can mean a variety of different things that if there's time, we can we can talk about the ambiguity of what bar exam means. But I think sitting in my role as dean, I think it's critical that, that we inject this this type of work, racial equity in the, in the role of becoming a lawyer as not something separate or a separate task force, but rather it's our responsibility in educating the next generation of attorneys throughout all facets, whether it's our curriculum, whether it's our uh, faculty and how we support faculty and support them in the classroom and thinking about new teaching methods uh, and how we support our student groups in co-curricular opportunities. So I would say it's not just about a dedicated group because my goal from a cultural standpoint is to infect the totality of our institution and to steward these kinds of conversations both in the, the institution, but as Kylie points out, also make sure that we are the leader we deserve to be in this space and make sure that, that we are fostering conversations that are as productive as possible across all of those metrics. Well, and I think you're all touching on so many different aspects of equity and access, both from, you know, what students have the ability to take the time and the resources to do to complete the bar process to who may be considering law school or is not considering law school because that might be too much of a challenge for the resources in their current lived situation. Um, and so I'm also wondering how you're thinking about different ways to expand who could see themselves as an advocate, as a lawyer, um, but then also thinking about how that changes depending upon the context, whether you know, you're know you practicing in downtown Portland versus Yamhill County versus you know somewhere else that has different resources, a different community group, but is still encountering a lot of the same challenges or same barriers to have a process that both has lawyers that look like you and is um, really as just as can be when we're addressing all of these inherent biases that we all carry into every space we, we enter. Well, I might take a brief run at this by simply responding that I think this is the question that causes us to think about what we mean by bar exam. And so, um, you know, even the question of what is an alternative, I'm not so sure that that we should be saying that we don't want a bar exam. That, I, I'm not sure that that's what we're saying. We don't want the exam as it sits in its present format. So when we think about pathways to professional licensure, we're talking about alternatives to those things. We're not necessarily saying there shouldn't be a capstone experience for law school graduates. What we're interested in is thinking about a way that respects all of the different variables, Tiffany, that you point out. And I think there are a handful of pathways we could talk about. So, so one of them is the supervised practice pathway that's out there in, in, um, and that has its own pluses and, and pitfalls. And, and we can talk through those uh, that there might be kind of this DC or, or um, Canadian uh, a model. And then we've got this other uh, pathway through Wisconsin where I take certain classes in law school and by graduating from the law school, I, I enter the bar. And then there's this kind of middle ground that New Hampshire 
And all of these has pl have pluses and minuses that we can fuss around with to the degree that time permits or that folks are interested. But New Hampshire is kind of down the middle between those two things where the legislature, uh, the, the board of bar examiners and the law schools are in partnership thinking about what a curriculum looks like and what experiential portfolio graduates might produce when they exit that curriculum and that gets reviewed by a member of, of the board of bar examiners. And so I just would close by saying those are the kinds of pathways that could supplement for the use of the terminology bar, but still maybe address some of the concerns that, that you've raised, Tiffany. So it's really about fostering the conversation to provide alternatives, but not necessarily suggest that we're advocating for whole elimination of some type of minimum competency. But as Sam earlier pointed out, evaluating that competency as it relates to the practice of law. I just wanted to follow up real quickly with that, where um, I'm excited that we're having this conversation, period, right? I mean, I think that we talked about these inequities that they, you know, they're not going away. They're not unique to just the pandemic. And really these barriers to entry into the legal profession and getting uh, practitioners in communities that need uh, practitioners, period, and practitioners that um, reflect the community there. Uh, I mean, the, the, it's not really on accident. I think that there is a lot of scholarship on um, the bar exam being implemented purposefully to be an additional barrier, an additional cost to communities of color and underrepresented um, people accessing law and wanting to keep it a little bit more elite. So I'm very excited that we are here, that there's um, some people of color on, on this task force that are making these waves and that there's so many women being represented now. And I'm excited that this is happening in Oregon. Oregon is not unique in uh, having a, some racist history, but as we point out in the, um, in the report, there are some unique um, histories that we have to deal with and reckon with um, if we want to move forward and, and be a more equitable society. And I think that uh, I just feel very fortunate to have been a part of this and to hopefully see Oregon be, continue to be a leader and really 100% this could have not have happened with just some excited grads that wanted to make a change because we usually do want to make a change, right? That's, the, that's what students do. Um, but we had the support of some wonderful deans, some amazing professors and the Supreme Court. Like they have, so many of our justices have been so supportive and really let me, Chief Justice Walters and uh, issuing an order about this very thing, about wanting to address racial inequities in the legal system here in Oregon. And I think that uh, we have the support, the time is right and the time is now to do something. And, and I hope that we can continue this energy and that Oregon leads the way in uh, discovering a new path. And, and that was kind of a perfect summary of everything that you've been talking about all evening. Um, I want to thank you all for your time and give you one final opportunity. If there are any other um, pieces of your experience or, or words that you would like to share with the audience before we close out, please feel free to do so, including where you see this going in the future. Well, I'll just offer my thanks again to you, Tiffany, and to the, the panelists for their time. It strikes me that not only did they spend months, it wasn't just the bar summer, we've been framing it that way, but I would just point out that there were months after the bar summer that our panelists and the task force writ large was kind enough to put work in throughout the fall, multiple rounds of edits. And for those interested, the uh, report will be published in our own Willamette Law Review, and we're incredibly proud of that. So we just close with my thanks and a recognition that this task force extended, if we're really being candid, a lot longer than perhaps I originally sold to them. So my thanks for the, the willingness to steward this through the fall and even the winter months. 
Yes, thank you all so much. And with that, I um, just want to thank you, Dean Galini, members of the task force, the class of 2020, for your time, for sharing your experiences, and for discussing all the great work that you have been doing since the summer, not just over the summer. Um, for those of you who joined us online, we thank you so much for your time and kind attention. If you enjoyed this discussion and would like to see more Willamette content, please continue to log in to WooStream, our online virtual programming platform. We look forward to future conversations. And until then, we hope you are staying warm and safe with your loved ones. And we, again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.